Avi Lewis. Um, I've got the honor of being the, being the host for this historic event where we here on these lands in the so-called British Columbia are going to sue big oil. This is an historic moment. Um, and you are gonna be able to tell everyone that you were here when it began. I am coming to you from a beautiful Whale Kwai, otherwise known as Half Moon Bay in Shishal territory on the so-called Sunshine Coast. And uh, it is uh, my great pleasure and honor and a delight to welcome uh, an amazing comrade who is going to uh, formally welcome us today. Chief Cookby Judy Wilson is both chief of the Nisqalnath Indian Band and secretary treasurer of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Chief Judy is a strong advocate for recognition of inherent title and rights and self-determination and for the fundamental shifts needed for the survival of all peoples, including the needs for a transition to clean energy and to support and maintain traditional food security and harvesting. Chief Judy Wilson, the floor is yours. Thank you for, for being here today. We just got to unmute you and then you'll be off to the races. There we go. Still don't have you, Judy. Um, somehow the mute popped back on. A little rock and roll at the beginning of any organizing okay. call. Uh, there is we it working go. Now? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, white Kufai Tep. Uh, hello, everyone. And um, thank you for the uh, the opening remarks uh, to introduce me, and also for all those being on the call here today. And it's, I believe in my heart that it's not by mistake that you're here. I, I believe everyone that's here is joining has either survived those catastrophic climate crises as we had last year, or uh, also are seeing, you know, the increase in control that oil and gas have in our country here with the oil ga and gas prices going up where they really shouldn't have to be. And also um, who's got the agenda. And it's our job to take that agenda and turn it around uh, if our, our mother earth is going to survive and if all people are going to be able to survive. Well, we want to be able to change um, the economy, we want to be able to change how uh, the reliance on dirty oil and gas is happening. So uh, I just wanted to say uh, I'm calling in from Australia to Musqueam and Squamish unceded territories. I was uh, in different meetings today. Uh, we uh, were, were at screenings last night for the Klabona keepers, which were keeping uh, shell gas and uh, the coal mines out of the uh, their territory. So they, they have their fill them out today. So Actually, I think the formal release is this fall, so it just shows the struggle our people go through day in, day out. Uh, so did you want me to launch into my remarks, or did you want me to do an opening prayer first? or As you see fit. Okay, I always do prayers. We're talking about the land, the water, and all of creation, So, and those are all sacred to all of us. So I'll just do a quick prayer before I do my remarks. Cook Sham, tell Cook me, Creator, we thank you for today and we thank you for your blessings and wisdom and guidance and all things. We pray that we can align to those teachings to care for Mother Earth is in our inherent responsibilities of all of us, not just Indigenous people or First Nations Creator, that we care for Mother Earth that we walk upon and we care for the water and we care for all of the animals, wildlife and all of the insects and the air included because even the air is being contaminated and polluted now, Creator that we can all survive in a good way and share what we have and also don't leave anybody behind those suffering that don't have any shelter, that do not have any food or even emotionally starved that they've never ever been told that anyone loves them creator. There's many out there that go through each day uh, not having a sense of belonging purpose or even uh, feeling loved creator. And we know you have unconditional love creator for all of us and we pray to reach out and align that today in this call and also that we can align our thoughts and minds on how we're gonna collectively work together to end this cycle of dirty oil and gas creator. Please help guide us and direct us in all things. And we, um, we love you creator and please be with us as well as our ancestors who walked on the land that showed us a good way creator. And we need to align ourselves back to that cook shaman creator. Okay, I'll do my remarks now, sorry about that, but I thought you had maybe somebody else doing the prayer, but. Uh, we always need to uh, ground ourselves and also re remember where we we're coming from and also that um, you know what our purpose in life is uh, some of us are going through transitions some of us maybe are, are you know kind of 
trying to latch on to where, where our best efforts are in making sense of this crazy world that we're living in right now with the uncertain times. And the uncertain times is because we're going in the wrong direction. We need to just realign ourselves and go in the right direction. So I'll start my remarks now. So I'm Cookby Judy Wilson from the Union BC Indian Chiefs and I'm Secretary Treasurer. And um, I'm really happy to be here today amongst this virtual circle from wherever you're calling in from. So I just wanted to start out with the uh, fossil fuel industry knowingly and disproportionately contributes to the pollution that causes climate change. And they're very aware of this and, and their trajectories are way off. I've been at many, many conferences and I've seen what they're trying to do, but their trajectory is off and they know it. They have to realign and uh, halt right now what they're doing, but they're, they're not. So that's what our job is. They promote and profit from products that are devastating communities, ecosystems and life all over the world. In many cases, such as coastal gas link and trans mountain pipelines, the development of fossil fuel infrastructure is destroying indigenous people's lands and livelihoods with no free prior informed consent. So I can say from our nation, they might may have bans that signed impact benefit agreements, but it's not collectively the people who are the 10,000 sequetin that have their uh, collective uh, title and rights that they hold uh, across our land. The impacts of the climate crisis extinguish our title to the lands when they are destroyed and as well as our rights to practice and pursue our traditional ways of life. There is no opting out of the impacts of climate change. We must do everything in our power to reduce emissions that, so that we may have a livable future. And that livable future is not just ours, it's our children and our grandchildren and those yet to come. There is no shared economic prosperity in oil. Fossil fuel companies continue to take in record profits while everyday people struggle with unaffordable ability of the overlapping disasters that we're experiencing. And if you were in BC, you would have experienced the four atmospheric rivers, the heat dome, the wildfires and the flooding. And I have to say that was in within short um, months or weeks of each other. So uh, sometimes we're experiencing them at the same time. And that makes us very uneasy for, you know, the flooding season we're in right now. And, you know, the wildfires that happen at the same time. So elected governments have not effectively held fossil fuel companies accountable for their role that they hold in driving us toward global climate crisis. Sorry about that. Our communities on the ground are experiencing the impacts of climate change and we're the only ones paying the price. Over 600 people died in the province. There was a report, I think it was like 619 uh, that died last year because of the heat dome and they did not have basic utilities in their homes to keep them safe during the heat wave. The costs for rebuilding critical infrastructure after the flooding from the atmospheric river event are astronomical. And there are still families living in hotels and in camps because they don't have a home to go back yet to. Um, I, I was talking to some, a number of the chiefs and uh, some of them themselves are displaced and then many of their members are still, are still uh, you know, not home. And it may be years till they get the housing and the infrastructure in their communities. So some can't go back to, to where their homes were. So it's really causing a, a huge issue. And these costs are not going away. They will continue to go as long as the big oil status quo is allowed to continue. It's past time that fossil fuel companies are held accountable for their role in the climate crisis. So um, I think now many, many of us across the, the world can see uh, what's driving the climate crisis and it's accountability and the role now uh, that government has to be able to say, you know, that they need to stop uh, subsidizing and supporting big oil. And it's not a surprise that the people have to take it in their own hands about suing big oil. It's almost like big pharmacy, you know, big pharma. Now we have big oil. So, you know, those are all, you know, profiting off of our people. And we're the ones paying the uh, price with our lives and with uh, our way of life and our land and uh, also the affordability, uh, you know, in even uh, affording the basics anymore. So those are my remarks, uh, Amy, um, if there's, I'm not sure what I do now, if there's questions or if there's another speaker after me. Thank you. Chief Wilson, thank you so much. Uh, you have in your, in your beautiful way summed up everything that we're here to feel and do together. I'm just looking through this extraordinary list of names and, and boxes on the screen. There's, this call is filled with power. So many uh, powerful activists, politicians and former politicians, academics um, and movement folks 
uh, who are going to make this happen. Um, so Chief Wilson, we've got a lot of speakers. Um, you're welcome to stay. You also have more things to do. So thank you for setting us in a good way. And we are going to basically go through your remarks uh, from a number of other voices over the course of the next 47 minutes. Um, let me give you a sense of, of what's going to happen next. Today, we are going to uh, launch this campaign to sue big oil. This is coming uh, to Canada uh, for the first time in a serious, coordinated, and, and planned out way. And so this really is a historic kickoff. Uh, and there is a beautiful new website, a shiny new website that just launched, it's just gone live, suebigoil.ca. No one will accuse you of multitasking. If you whip over there, send it to everyone and use the hashtag suebigoil on social media. And while we're on the call, feel free to promote it and gather people. On that website, there's lots of good information and there are lots of ways to get involved. All of these hearts and minds gathered here today, we all wanna know what can we do? As Chief Wilson said, where is where can we throw our bodies on a lever that will make a difference? This is a big one, it's not the only one. It's integrated with a whole bunch of other movement activity, uh, but this is a significant moment. So suebigoil.ca. In the next 45 minutes, you're gonna hear from someone who has done it and won it. It's not the first time that big oil has been sued. It has happened before and we have someone who is instrumental in the historic uh, Dutch case. And we're gonna hear about that. We're gonna hear from someone firsthand to put the human reality in the picture and talk about the devastating impacts of the climate emergency on individual lives. We're gonna hear from two legal experts who will describe why this campaign is both necessary and winnable. And finally, Fiona's gonna lay out how we're gonna win how you can get involved and how this campaign is gonna unfold, how we're gonna do this together, all right? That's a basic shape of the proceedings. All the speakers are gonna stick to their time because otherwise I will brutally move things along in the spirit of changing everything on an emergency basis. Do you agree? Okay, me too. So first, it is my pleasure to bring on Lori Vandenberg, co-lead of the global public finance team at Oil Change International. Lori led the legal and campaign strategy for the historic Shell case in the Netherlands for three years prior to joining Oil Change International. Lori, you were part of the movement to sue one of the biggest oil multinationals. And in that historic moment uh, in May, just exactly one, almost exactly one year ago, you won. Tell us the brief version of the story. How did you do it? What happened? Um, yeah, we did a lot, but I'll share just a brief story of how we did it. Um, so this case actually started with a different climate case um, that was filed before this case was filed. So that was the Urgenda case um, that was filed against the Dutch government. And they won this case in 2015. And that win planted the seed for this case against Shell. Um, so after that win against the Dutch government um, in this historic climate case, um, the uh, director of Friends of the Earth Netherlands reached out to Roger Cox, who was the leading lawyer on that case, and asked him, is there a possibility to sue big oil? Can we also hold Shell legally accountable for um, wrecking the climate? Um, and that's when I was brought on uh, at Milieu Defensi to start building this case with Roger Cox. And back then, I didn't feel very confident that we had a chance of actually winning the case. But I thought that even if we wouldn't win, there was so much that we could win by filing it, uh, because it would help us draw attention to the role of the fossil fuel industry and specifically Shell in uh, wrecking the climate. And it would also force Shell to defend its inadequate and misleading climate plans in court. Um, over time, uh, there was more and more scientific, scientific evidence that was being published on the danger of surpassing 1.5 degrees of global heating. Um, and uh, a group of journalists also leaked many documents on um, uh, Shell's early knowledge and elaborate knowledge of the climate crisis and of the role of fossil fuels in causing it. Um, and those documents also showed that instead of taking action, they actually chose to mislead the public and uh, work to stop, delay, or weaken climate action. So we got more evidence and were able to build an even stronger case. So we took about a year to do the background research for, uh, this, camp uh, for this case and campaign. Um, we took that year to also build the legal strategy and got input from many different actors on that. And then we sent uh, Shell a letter in 2019 to inform them that we would sue them if they wouldn't take action. Um, and a year later, we filed the case. 
So these cases um, have symbolic value, they have strategic value, and they have legally binding consequences. Can you uh, tell us briefly about the role of the movement outside the courtroom, the pressure that that put uh, on the process or how it contributed to this historic win and what you think the consequences are for one of the gigantic oil multinationals who in the words of Joe Biden uh, last week made more money than God last year. Um, yeah, so the movement uh, support for this case was really strong in the Netherlands, and uh, that has been really important for uh, the case, both to secure the win, uh, but also to uh, get the most impact with this case. So from the start, when we started to build the campaign, we focused on um, trying to get as many people uh, as possible on board and get them to file the case with us as co-plaintiffs. Um, so we launched a big campaign where we went around the country, organized um, uh, information evenings at community centers. Um, we organized workshops and festivals, uh, gave guest lectures at uh, universities and in schools, and, um, and also launched social media campaigns to uh, get as many people as possible to sign up as co-plaintiffs. And in the end, we were able to file this case together with 17,379 uh, people which is a lot of people in the Netherlands, um, and also together with six other NGOs. And um, this showed that it wasn't just Friends of the Earth Netherlands that thought that Shell had a legal responsibility to act on the climate crisis and to reduce its emissions. It showed that there was broad backing for this case, and it also helped to um, spur more public debate around the case, which we thought was really important because it would have helped expose the role of the fossil fuel industry in the climate crisis. Um, and yeah, we won the case in, in May last year. So the court ordered Shell to reduce its emissions by 45% by 2030 um, to stay on track for 1.5 degrees. And um, uh, this basically means that Shell needs to um, phase down its oil and gas production because there's no other way in which it could realize these emission reductions. And I think that this shows for other, um, to other oil and gas companies that they can be held legally accountable, that they have a, a, a legal responsibility to act. And that if they don't act, that uh, we as the people will hold them accountable. And um, we've seen like media coverage of this case all over the world. And I'm sure that uh, we've managed to put the heat to the shins. That is a Dutch expression. I don't know if it also works in the US, but uh, I'm sure that we've made the, the industry very nervous with this case. Shell has got hot shins now. Um, la la last question. Um, I loved, I read the report that was the whole story uh, that, 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 you, that you released from the case. In fact, it'd be great if someone could pop that link in the chat. I, one thing that I really appreciated just as a climate activist um, is how forthcoming you were with how you did it and um, and encouraging others to take up, learn from the process that you followed. And that's what exactly what we want to do here now. Do you have any quick advice for us as we initiate this process here in so-called British Columbia? Uh, is there anything that, that you can distill that you learned from this gigantic precedent um, that could help us in, in doing it in our way? Um, yeah, I think one of the things that we learned from doing this case is that when, that when you are pioneering, when you are doing something for the first time, you have to figure things out along the way, and it will be impossible to know everything um, from the start. Um, so you have to continue to reassess what you're doing and to continue to address your strategy and also the campaign narrative and the messaging that you're using. So you have to continue to see if it's still appropriate and if you need to adjust it to respond to kind of new realities because um, we are continuously facing new realities. I'd also say that it's really important to um, build a cross-disciplinary collaboration. Um, so we had to work with scientists, with lawyers, with other NGOs, with journalists, with academics, students, and even theater producers to have the impact that we ended up having um, until now with this case. Um, and I'd say that one other thing that I'll highlight is that we've also seen that the fossil fuel industry will always try to reinvent itself to justify its continued existence. And they also have a massive PR machine. Um, and they always come with kind of new false solutions that they will um, put forward to yeah, justify their continued existence. 
Um, so it's really important to stay on top of um, all of what they are putting forward and to not give the industry a chance to spread misleading um, uh, information um, and uh, yeah, to basically not give them the chance to mislead the public on their climate ambitions. Thank you so much, Lori. That was an incredible intervention and so much of it resonates here. You're getting the silent Zoom applause, the massive wave of silent applause uh, on Zoom. I, so many things resonate here, including having to keep up with the greenwashing, uh, adapt to changing conditions. When, when you started that suit in the Netherlands, oil wasn't at over $100 a barrel. They weren't drowning in gigantic uh, uh, pandemic profiteering uh, profits. And, uh, and, and we didn't have the net zero uh, commitments from every single institution on earth, most of which are magical thinking and fossil fuel subsidies when you look at all of the fake solutions that are being advocated these days. So we have many, many targets in view. Uh, Lori, thank you so much for sharing that experience. At the heart of any of these strategies is the human reality. As Chief Wilson so poignantly put it at the beginning, the, the lives of people in community that are being threatened, that are being extinguished, uh, that are being transformed uh, and harmed forever by the climate emergency uh, uh, and the authors of that emergency uh, disproportionately are the companies that knew, that lied, that covered up, and that continue to profit uh, from poisoning water, air, earth, and, and, and humans. Um, and so I wanna bring on now Julia Kidder, who is a Canadian Norwegian PhD student uh, at the at UBC School of Community and Regional Planning, regional planning um, focused on coastal climate adaptation. Uh, Julia also works at West Coast Environmental Law. She's the climate communication specialist, and she's going to tell us about last summer's heat dome and her own personal experience with it. Julia. Um, first, thank you, Abby and 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 Judy, uh, and and also just uh, Laurie for that incredible story. Um, uh, Brings so much hope into this uh, setting. Um, yeah, I'm I'm here to uh, talk. I know that some of my colleagues have heard my story before, um, but uh, uh, I'm going to tell it again. Uh, I around this time last year, as many of you will remember, uh, weather warnings had started popping up describing this possible anomaly heat event forecast to occur at the end of June. Uh, and I was living in Ashcroft at the time uh, where summer temperatures regularly regularly linger in the mid 30s and like other you know BC interior hotspots like Cache Creek and Lillooet, Spence's Bridge and Lytton. Um, this is something that uh, that does happen often, but the, the heat predicted was much, much more intense. Um, I was mostly alone at our place during the week of the heat dome when the power went and our irrigation pumps uh, stopped working. So we, uh, Jimmy rigged enough low ampage power into the house so that I could have either the fridge or the small bedroom AC unit on it one time. Um, and I realized that I would mostly have to sort of stay indoors and I had alarms on my phone reminding me to drink water and wrapped cold towels around my dog and cat and put, put ice packs on their bed. Um, but when I saw the heat projection maps for the lower mainland um, with temperatures as high as 42 degrees predicted in places like Hope and Abbotsford and Mission and Chilliwack, I remember feeling anxious and worried uh, for how those communities who weren't uh, used to the heat would, would cope and manage. Uh, but as the week progressed, I realized that actually none of us across the province were prepared for what a climate induced heat dome would do to our bodies. Uh, because human beings are fragile. Uh, we're, not, we're not meant to live in under a pressure cooker. Um, and yeah, anyways, I just, after a few days at 45 degrees Celsius heat, uh, I began to have uh, auditory hallucinations and headaches, and I didn't know that they were uh, due to my prolonged exposure to the, to the heat. Uh, and just to like to paint the picture, and I know that so many people experience that in, that intensity that happens when things get really really hot. Um, the the fire alarms were going off inside the house because it was so hot outside, and I was wrapping like wet face towels around the brass doorknobs with elastic bands so that I wouldn't you know burn my hands. And if I went outside, I uh, remember feeling like I was 
you know, um, I had was standing in front of like a hot air, you know, blow dryer or like a barbecue or something. Um, and I nearly drove off the road before fainting at a turn between Kamloops and Cache Creek on the 29th of June. Um, and this was occurring in the afternoon, just as emergency vehicles were speeding past heading towards Lytton that afternoon, just as a train had sparked a fire that raised the entire town. Uh, after Lytton had beat all of Canada's heat records for uh, two or three days in a row. Um, and it should also be noted, I think simply out of respect that nothing substantial has been done to rebuild the village of Lytton, despite it being tokenized as a telltale climate catastrophe by all levels of government, by corporations, and also by the uh, ENGO and charity sector. Um, but that aside, I, I, June 29th will forever be etched in, in my mind. Um, Luckily, my cousin, who is a paramedic and working in Williams Lake, uh, which is just a bit north of, of uh, Ashcroft, called me on the phone and, and recognized that I, you know, my symptoms, uh, a severe heat stroke, I was slurring my words and I had numbness in my hands and I was finding it hard to balance myself, which, which were symptoms that kind of continued over the course of the next few months. Uh, but she picked me up in Ashcroft and we rode down in the middle of the night over the one open highway that, that was not closed due to, to forest fires uh, towards the Coquihalla. And um, we're driving, you know, uh, uh, I haven't talked about this for a long time, so excuse me. Um, uh, but we, we were driving through a fairly apocalyptic, it felt like uh, electrical storm uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, so, so it was uh, lightning strikes occurring very frequently and, um, and just uh, darkness and smoke and flickering of fire uh, sort of all over the place. Anybody who was in the interior uh, really knows what this felt like um, this last summer and also summers before uh, when we pulled up to Merritt to fill up gas, uh, various evacuees we're mingling in the relative cool that is offered at four in the morning, uh, smoke in the air and flies everywhere. So the next morning I was taken to urgent care at UBC uh, where I received fluids and a CT scan showing no permanent damage to my brain, which is great. Um, but I am also uh, a privileged and privileged and healthy person. And I cannot imagine how many untold stories there are from last year. Um, the, the heat wave killed hundreds of people. It cut people's lives short. And then the forest fires robbed entire communities of their livelihood livelihoods. Um, when the floods came in November, we also saw how short-sighted colonial planning techniques like the drainage of Sumas Lake to make way for farmland 100 years ago and a lack of official government plans combined to create a perfect storm that put local communities in the line of climate impacts. Uh, and these impacts are the direct attributable consequences of a maniacal negligent fossil fuel industry. So we, we, we saw and we continue to see how this disproportionately impacts indigenous people, the elderly, low income groups, migrant diasporas, those struggling with men ongoing mental health epidemics and the opioid, opioid crisis in places like Vancouver. And these traumatic burdens and their associated costs should not be on regular people. Why should we, should they have to pay with our, their lives for the crimes of major polluters? So asking top global oil and gas corporations to pay for the damages caused by these products is one way to generate risk for them in terms that they can understand uh, in order to get them to take the climate crisis seriously. And, and just as Canada claims the revenue generated by pipeline expansion projects are necessary to pay for renewables, the global fossil fuel industry has gaslighted the general public so hard into believing that the injuries that we're experiencing now due to climate change are a mess of our own making or that we can calculate our carbon footprints or recycle our way out of this. And we now know that this is un fundamentally untrue. Um, and our movements need a diversity of tactics to derail these corporations and their carefree greed. And I think taking them to court uh, may be one of those tactics. So thank you so much for listening. And I'm sorry I had to write it down and, and, and read a little bit, but I'm just really, really uh, grateful to be here uh, with, with all of you. And uh, let's sue big oil. Julia, thank you so much. That was really powerful and moving. And um, I, I appreciate so much how you brought in all of the intersecting causes, all of the communities most at risk, the people who have been suffering the longest and the hardest. Um, but your own personal testimony and story was was um, was really hard and and meaningful and real. And I think the amount of climate grief and climate anxiety that people are feeling, some of it we can funnel into the work. Uh, some of it we can trans use to transform as a source of renewable energy. Some of it just has to be, and we have to feel it together. 
And so thank you so much for the vulnerability and the power of sharing that experience. Totally terrifying and real and took me right back to what, what we all felt um, a year ago. Um, okay, so if we're gonna pursue a legal tactic, we are gonna need lawyers. No lawyers jokes here today. We're gonna sue big oil. <laughs> we need lawyers to lead on this uh, and we will provide the push behind them. Uh, so I wanna bring on Andrew Gage. Uh, Andrew is a staff lawyer uh, and head of West Coast Environmental Law's Climate Program. Uh, Andrew's written papers and book chapters and reports on uh, climate and the law. And Andrew's going to give us a sense of, of the legal dimensions of this moment uh, and where the Sue Big Oil campaign is going to land. Andrew. Thanks, Abby. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. We're now over 160 people uh, online for this launch, which is wonderful. Um, I'm joining you from the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people in Southern Vancouver Island. So when I think about uh, the Sue Big Oil campaign, and I, I define it in terms of three things, the, the problem that we're trying to solve, and here I mean not just climate change, but the fact that Canadian and global society keeps making climate change worse, uh, and that our communities and communities around the world are paying the price for that. The solution, the name of the campaign says, says what we think is at least part of the solution. Um, and then the result, what do we hope to get uh, for ourselves and the world by uh, doing this? So the problem, we've known about climate change for an awfully long time. Uh, Dr. Ed Edward Teller was a noted American physicist who was asked by the American Petroleum Institute to speak on in 1959 on the future of energy. And he said, whenever you burn conventional fuel, you create carbon dioxide, its presence in the atmosphere causes a greenhouse effect. And he sketched out what that actually meant. Uh, it's last Sunday it was 30 years since the world's governments came together and promised to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at levels that would prevent uh, dangerous anthropogenic interference. And yet this is what the history of greenhouse gas emissions in the world looks like. Uh, this is 1959 when Dr. Teller issued his warning. Uh, after that, there were a whole series of, of warnings and, um, uh, by oil and gas industry scientists to their employers about um, the fact that not only the climate change was happening, but also the uh, the types of impacts that it was going to cause. Uh, and you know, this is when in 1992, the world's governments made that historic commitment to get greenhouse gas emissions under control. And yet half of the historic greenhouse gas emissions, the emissions in the atmosphere, occurred after they promised to, to uh, deal with the problem. Well, so why is that? Here's a, a partial answer. Um, in 1998, the American Petroleum Institute and other, and other fossil fuel industry bodies developed a strategy to undermine public confidence in climate science. Uh, they said that victory would be achieved when the general public saw those pressing for action on climate change on the basis of science as out of touch with reality. I would suggest that the actions of these corporations are entirely economically reasonable. We live in a society that separates the costs of the fossil fuel economy, the climate impacts from the benefits of the fossil fuel economy, and that each stage in that timeline corporations chose to maximize their profits. CEOs, shareholders, the government, even the public all assume that uh, the investors, corporations, and countries that benefit from burning fossil fuels won't pay for the harm caused by those products. And increasingly we get heat waves, wildfires, and flooding and realize that maybe these costs are real and the government ends up stepping in to use our taxpayer dollars to pay for the, to, to help out and pay for those impacts. And the result is an industry that appears by all economic indicators to be hugely profitable uh, because it's not paying for the costs that it's causing. What we need to do is look for ways that bring together the benefits and the costs. And then we'll realize that these co companies are not the wealth creators we think they are. They are in fact climate debtors. Uh, this is not just some historic uh, quirk of, of um, uh, that helps us understand why companies used to fund uh, climate misinformation. This, as long as this disconnect continues to exist uh, and companies continue to make money while the rest of us pay the price, the um, we can expect not just government, uh, not just corporations, but governments and investors to make poor business decisions. Banks do what banks 
do, which is to look for good investment opportunities. Governments uh, do what governments do, which is to um, regulate their, the environment in ways that don't kill what appears to them to be a goose that lays the golden eggs. So Canada's emissions reduction plan uh, projects an actual increase in emissions from the oil sands and increased production in oil and gas across the industry by 2030. They subsidize solutions uh, that allow the industry to keep producing uh, while avoiding responsibility for the um, harm from their products. We, they keep produce, uh, approving new fossil fuel infrastructure and in fact are actually building a pipeline for the fossil fuel industry because this appears to be a wealth generator. Meanwhile, people around the world, including here in BC, are paying the price. The more than 600 people who died in the heat dome, the residents of Lytton, we are paying billions of dollars to respond to heat waves, flooding, and other climate fuel disasters. And yet that's not still not close to the $5.3 billion per year that the Insurance Bureau of Canada estimates we should be spending, Canadian municipalities should be spending to adapt to climate change. Uh, indigenous communities, of course, are among the most impacted. Local governments and other communities have no ability to raise the types of funds they need to deal with climate change, and the funds available from se senior levels of government are completely inadequate. So let's do a big oil. We're proposing a class action lawsuit that allows communities to, to collaborate together um, to, based on the costs of preparing uh, for a more resilient future, uh, broadening public nuisance uh, against at least five of the world's largest fossil fuel companies for their proportionate share of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, St uh, Professor Stephen Wood's gonna speak in a few minutes about how um, this, there is a legal basis for, for this, but I'd just like to highlight that we've seen before that big industry can be taken down with litigation like this. That litigation, we've heard from Laurie about how litigation is working in, has worked in the Netherlands. Uh, there's a case before the German courts and in the US there's 20 local governments in three states that have sued fossil fuel companies for climate damages. So this is being done, uh, we can do it here. This type of litigation is global in scope. It's not just about regulating emissions on a country by country basis, but because the harm occurs here in Canada, Canadian courts have powers to order global companies to pay for their share of the harm caused by global emissions. This is important. Everything else we do is country by country, and this has something we can do that has a global impact, treats climate change as a global problem. It's financially manageable uh, because that class action law allows for governments to share resources uh, and it also protects governments from having some of the risks association associated with litigation. We're proposing that each local government may need to just put in one dollar per person to to deal to fund the initial stage of a uh, uh, certifying this as a class action uh, as well as supporting that then for further funding from crowdfunding and private philanthropy etc. And the type of litigation is popular. We've polled on this and over half of British Columbians strongly support or somewhat support uh, the idea of a lawsuit against local against fossil fuel companies. But what do we get out of this? Now I'd like to emphasize that even before we file a lawsuit, this is treating climate change as serious enough to deserve litigation. Uh, fossil fuel companies, investors, and governments may take notice of public calls for litigation, and that may in itself change how some of the decisions they make. Uh, we also know from polling that talking about climate lawsuits actually increases public support for other types of climate action. And finally, we're highlighting that the oil and gas industry is responsible for climate change. We're going directly after the, the industry that has done most to contribute. Once we file a lawsuit, things get even more interesting. Uh, I, the first stage in a class action lawsuit is a judge has to confirm that the case has merit. The moment that happens, and we believe it will, fossil fuel companies will need to disclose that they're being sued to their investors. The companies will, need, will want to be able to demonstrate to courts that they're acting responsibly in light of climate change, and that will change their behavior. And hopefully governments and investors will see that this coming litigation is a risk that favors transitioning away from fossil fuel companies. In the longer term, uh, we of course are hoping that fossil fuel companies will actually be ordered to pay a fair share of climate costs. That means local governments get needed resources. It also means that these costs and also the, the potential for liability even for other fossil fuel companies will need to be recorded as a liability on their balance sheets, modifying how each of these actors 
few uh, climate change and, and the, the need decisions. We're also setting a court precedent if we're successful that could be copied elsewhere. And uh, because it's better for the companies if the uh, these issues are managed on a global basis rather than through a, a whole series of courts, it creates pressure for better international treaties. So what does the Sue Big Oil campaign look like? Uh, we're going to hear first from Professor Wood, but we're all, in a few moments, my colleague Fiona is going to take us um, through the steps of the, the campaign. But I would like to acknowledge that 24 local governments have already publicly called on fossil fuel companies to pay their share. Um, many local government councillors have indicated their support for suing big oil, but lawsuits have not gone ahead. What's missing is a broad groundswell of people asking them to do that. Um, our goal is to build public support so that councillors and elected officials and candidates know that if they are going to be viewed as a climate leader, they need to be taking this type of climate, climate action. Thank you very much. And I'll hand things back over to Abby. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, that was a fantastic presentation and is people are already opening their wallets in the chat. There's a number of people who want to start contributing immediately and I appreciate and understand the impatience. I don't know if we can take donations right away, but I'll tell you what I just did. I just went to the website uh, and ordered a t-shirt and a bunch of stickers. Uh, at the very, very least, we can start splashing this beautiful, uh, in your face, powerful and elegant logo everywhere. Andrew's uh, el elegantly modeling uh, the fashion product. Um, oh, there's Fiona's got on hers too. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper into the legal basis uh, for this, um, for this suit. Uh, and I want to bring on Professor Stephen Wood, who is the Canada Research Chair in Law, Society and Sustainability at the Allard School of Law at UBC, uh, where Stephen also directs the Center for Law uh, and the Environment. And Stepan's current work relates to the nature, environmental right, the rights of nature, uh, which is sort of an underlying concept uh, uh, in the suit. Uh, environmental rights, homelessness, the reception of English law in colonial British Columbia, and the future of the International Organization for Standardization. I don't know if that <laughs> obscure body is really relevant to the case, Stepan, but please take us through your legal read on this historic uh, thing we're launching today. Thanks so much, Avi, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, Andrew has already laid the groundwork. I just wanted to add to what he's already said. So in 2019, I co-authored an open letter from 28 leading legal experts across the country saying that there was a solid uh, legal basis for Canadian governments to sue carbon majors for a fair share of the cost of the harms of climate change. And since then, the case for climate accountability litigation has only gotten stronger as climate change impacts have worsened, climate science has advanced, uh, demands for corporate management and disclosure of climate related risks have increased, legal recognition of a right to live in a healthy environment has spread, and the evidence of deliberate deception by the industry has mounted. The logic of climate accountability is simple. Companies that profit from selling a product they know is harmful should pay their share of the costs of the resulting harm. And this logic has been applied successfully to a range of harmful products from asbestos to breast implants to tobacco. So climate accountability lawsuits are unprecedented in Canada, but don't confuse novelty of subject matter and scale with novelty of legal theories. These lawsuits can proceed on the basis of well-recognized legal wrongs. One ju a US judge said in March of this year, in refusing to dismiss a climate accountability lawsuit brought by Honolulu, Hawaii, said such lawsuits raise unprecedented but traditional common law claims based exclusively on well-established causes of action. So climate accountability litigation by Canadian governments against carbon majors has numerous potential legal bases, including private nuisance, public nuisance, negligence, conspiracy, and strict liability, not to mention uh, false or misleading advertising and breach of securities laws. Now, certainly there will be legal obstacles including causation, duty of care, justiciability, and jurisdiction over foreign defendants. But plaintiffs have reasonable prospects for overcoming these obstacles in Canadian law, 
And they can point to numerous, a, grow, a rapidly growing body of international precedents from the Netherlands and Germany to the Philippines, and most importantly, next door in the United States. Uh, local and state governments in 11 US states have launched 21 climate accountability lawsuits against carbon majors since 2017. Um, they have overcome almost every legal challenge they have faced so far. Almost all of them are at a preliminary stage of determining whether they belong in state or federal court, an issue that doesn't arise in Canada. And so far the plaintiffs have won uh, on this issue almost uniformly across the country. Only a couple have reached the stage of testing the legal basis for their claims. One early case by New York City uh, in federal court was dismissed because its common law claims were preempted by federal legislation, another issue that is distinct to the United States. Whereas this other one, the Honolulu case, uh, recently survived a motion to dismiss because the judge said it raises well-established common law claims. Some people might object that climate accountability litigation is hypocritical because everyone, including governments, is implicated in the fossil economy. But the companies that make and sell the fuels, they know that cause climate change while resisting regulation and misleading the world about the problem must bear some legal responsibility for the resulting costs. It's imperative, I think, for municipal and higher level governments as prudent managers of public funds and infrastructure to explore all reasonable avenues to recover these costs so they don't fall entirely on ordinary community members. Some might also object that climate accountability litigation is bad for the economy, but we know that climate change is much worse for the economy and urgent action to accelerate the low carbon transition is good for the economy. Climate accountability litigation isn't an attack on Canada's resource industries. It's an opportunity for them to step up and be responsible. Um, and I'll just conclude, climate accountability litigation against carbon majors is not high in the sky. It has arrived in several countries. It is working. It has a sound legal basis and its time has come in Canada. Thank you so much, Stepan. Uh, incredibly concise and uh, a powerful reminder. Um, you know, of what, we, of what we all see is happening. I can, the CBC radio yesterday, the city of Abbotsford is, is, is coming up with a new uh, a flood plan. It's gonna cost billions of dollars for a single town. It'll take years to execute. And who knows how many times they'll be underwater before they get their new flood plan actually built and on the ground. Who's gonna pay for it? Municipalities have, result, have, have, have had responsibilities downloaded on them for decades, while their capacity to raise revenue uh, has been pulled back by, by provinces, by the feds. It's a trickle down of, of, us, of the austerity mindset. And now the front lines where people actually face flooding, fires, and other climate emergencies are the least equipped to deal with these gigantic capital costs. Where is all the money in the hundreds of billions of dollars of profits raked in uh, by big oil year after year after year. And as we've seen in so many other jurisdictions, there are lots of people going after it. Polluters have to pay. All right, we are coming on to the top of the hour and to the end of this call. I think we've heard extraordinary presentations uh, about the rationale for this tactic, uh, about its prospects, about the human urgency, and about how it intersects and supports so many other things going on in the climate action space. And at every stage, as Andrew laid out, the, the legal uh, tactic can reinforce other things that are going on in the climate justice movement with wins along the way. The primary one and the one that we're all, what we all came here today is to figure out how to mobilize. What's the plan? What does the campaign look like? How do I step up and do my part in this historic campaign? And thank goodness we have Fiona Koza here who is the climate accountability strategist at West Coast Environmental Law and has been holding multinational companies accountable for environmental damage and human rights harms for a couple of decades. Fiona is gonna lay out uh, how we can help. Let's do it, Fiona, put us to work. Thanks, Avi. And can you see my screen, full screen? Absolutely. All right, great. Um, I am going to tell you how you can get involved in the Sue Big Oil campaign. First, we need a lawsuit, and we need to convince our local governments to file a lawsuit to sue big oil. 
To do this, we need to build a movement of British Columbians who are concerned that they do not want uh, communities to have to pay for the skyrocketing costs of climate change. I'm really excited to launch this campaign today with you and to launch, oh shoot, it is not advancing my slide. I'll just take this moment while you find the forward button to tell people that, do we have the video? Did the video come together? Not we got it. Okay, hot off the editor's screen. We're gonna preview the campaign video, a rough cut oh, of it, a sneak okay. preview at the end of Fiona's presentation. So hang in there. If you don't have anywhere to go right at the top of the clock, you have that to look forward to. Thanks. So I'm excited to share with you our website that we launched today. On this website, you'll find everything you need to get involved and the resources. And very, very importantly, what I would like to share with you at the bottom of the screen of the, on our website, you can see this blue box, teal colored box that says sign the declaration. And this is the most important first step to become involved in the Sue Big Oil campaign. Once you sign the declaration, you will get updates about the campaign, and it will also help us demonstrate to our local governments how many people, how many tens of thousands of people are calling on their government to sue big oil. So make sure you sign the declaration right after this call. I'm gonna read for you what the declaration says. For decades, oil and gas corporations have known that burning fossil fuels would cause the heat waves, wildfires, drought, and flooding that we're now experiencing in BC. These multinational companies spent millions to deceive, deny, and distract us on their way to billions in profit by preventing action on climate change. We must force oil and gas corporations to change their business practices and pay their fair share for the harm they're causing. How do we pay for a safer and healthier future for all British Columbians? Let's sue big oil. We call on our local governments to take urgent action to reduce our fossil fuel use and protect us from future heat waves, wildfires, flooding, and other climate impacts. To set aside at least $1 per person towards a community fund to sue big oil. To join with other local governments to file a class action lawsuit to recover a fair share of our climate costs. To work to build equitable, sustainable systems for transportation, housing, and food that put people and the planet before corporate profits and to cooperate with indigenous peoples in doing so. So by signing the declaration, you will join the movement to big oil. But in addition to joining the movement, we want you to help us build the movement. Um, there are the ways we can do this on, on social media, on the street, and, um, and by hosting Sue uh, big oil house parties, which I will tell you about shortly. Now, our campaign trajectory over the coming through the through this year, this summer, as I mentioned, is building the Sue Big Oil movement. Then in the fall, we will be approaching local governments, trying to convince them to launch this class action lawsuit, and we can do it. In terms of helping us uh, build a movement, you can help us by spreading the word on social media. On our website, you'll find these downloadable graphics that you can use to help spread the word on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And our hashtag is, not surprisingly, hashtag Sue Big Oil. Please join us online. Another way to spread the word is taking it to the street. And we have a few resources on our website that you can use to help promote the campaign and yeah, build, build a momentum to Sue Big Oil in BC's communities. We have posters here, and you'll notice on the poster there is a QR code. So if you put this poster up on your campus at your community center, people can use the QR code to get directly to the website and sign the Sue Big Oil Declaration. In addition, we also have stickers that you can order on our website, distribute to your friends to help spread the word about suing big oil. In addition, on our website, there are some helpful resources that will help you talk about Sue Big Oil. Maybe you're not exactly sure what to say. So we have an introduction to Sue Big Oil. We also have a communications guide that will guide you through the basic points to help you speak clearly about the campaign. And lastly, I want to tell you about Sue Big Oil house parties. Um, these are an important and fun way to help build the movement to Sue Big Oil. And hosting a Sue Big Oil house party is easy and we will support you. To start with, think of the people who you know who may be interested in suing big oil. This may be your friends, your neighbors, your family, your colleagues, your classmates, and invite them to a gathering at your house or if you prefer online. And at the party, 
we you would talk about through big oil using the communications guide that we provide showed you on the last slide you can gather signatures on the declaration there are print versions of the declaration or you could have it on your laptop or people could use the qr code and and join and sign online on their phone. We will also offer to join your Sue Big House, Sue Big Oil House party um, on a Zoom call so that we can answer any questions that you or your friends may have about the campaign. At the Sue Big Oil party, you can brainstorm ideas about how are you going to spread the word in your community? Maybe make plans. How are you going to, like, when are you going to go and meet with your city council to get there, to get them, their support in joining the, the campaign and, and launching a class action lawsuit? And also at the party, of course, you can share stickers, posters. Um, and if anybody is already excited about the idea of hosting a Subing Oil party, you can raise your hand now in my to big oil team, we'll take note of your name and follow up with you. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, I think there's a reactions button and there you can raise hands. Awesome, that is really exciting. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm also thrilled to say that there are so many organizations who are, in, who are endorsing and um, joining us in this campaign to sue big oil. And um, if you are if you are a part of an organization and you would like to endorse, please do send us an email. We will add your uh, logo to our website. And to conclude, I just want to remind you to visit our website, suebigoil.ca, and sign the declaration. And that is how you will stay in touch and how you'll convey to our local governments that DC communities want this, need this now. Um, you can contact us for more information at info at suebigoil.ca. And again, if you're on social media, please join us at hashtag suebigoil. Thank you so much. Amazing, here. Fiona. Thank you. We are just coming up to the top of the clock here. So many people in the chat are letting us know about other things going on. I'm thinking about where the climate movement in BC gathers, where all kinds of organizations could sign on to the Sioux Big Oil campaign. And there just happens to be the first Climate Action Provincial Assembly uh, tonight at 6 p.m. Guy Dauncey put it in the chat. It's a great place. I'm sure there will be big Sioux Big Oil organizers there because it's a, it's a, it's a remarkable gathering. Um, and it's the kind of place where we can come together across all of the different organizations we work with um, and make a campaign like this take flight. Now, as I promised, we have a sneak preview, rough cut version. I think it's a bit suspenseful since I don't know if anyone has seen it yet of the one minute campaign video. Julia's got it queued up. We're gonna end this meeting uh, with a rousing chant. But before that, let's uh, let's try to share the video and see, see what it looks like. It should be ready for a proper launch in the days to come. Here we go. Do it, Julia. It was the worst summer of my life. You got it. It was working beautifully. Here we go again. It was the worst summer of my life. It was so hot. I could barely breathe. After the wildfires forced people from their homes, we were grateful when the rains came. But those rains flooded my family's farm, devastating our home and business. Scientists tell us that these impacts were almost certainly caused by climate change. And we know that climate change is mainly caused by the burning of fossil fuels, like oil and gas. Oil and gas companies have known for decades that burning fossil fuels would cause the heat waves, wildfires, and flooding that we are now experiencing in BC. These multinational corporations have spent millions to deceive, deny, and distract us. Meanwhile, they've earned billions in profit by preventing action on climate change. It's not right that CEOs and investors are pocketing all that profit while we pay the cost of climate damages. We need to make oil and gas corporations take climate change seriously and pay their fair share. Join us. Together, we can sue big oil.